I find it interesting that we can check black men all the time, but black men can't check us. We could tell a black man he got to go to therapy. We could tell a black man he lazy. He needs to help around the house. But your black man can't get you up at 6 a.m. Be like, we doing a workout. Your black man can't say, hey, babe, when you on the phone with your family, you're gossiping a lot. And then when you get off the phone with them, it's negativity in this household. Is there a way you can participate in your family stuff that doesn't hinder our relationship? You're treating me like your sister's baby father. And it hurts me every time you get off the phone with her. Like, I don't understand. Why is it that a partnership when it comes to betterment is only us to them when it can't be them to us? fearlessly we are finishing with our marriage work series i'm so excited about this because i believe we need to promote healthy marriages out here in these social media streets not only in the social media streets but also in the real world right because that's where we live and today's guests are going to bless you in a tremendous way because i've been rocking with them for some years and finally got a chance to interview them today's on today's uh, podcast. So let's jump into it. Uh, she is known as a life architect and is an emotional health specialist, certified professional life coach, and public speaker. I was watching some of her videos the other day. I want her to give her information at the end as well. Uh, she is uh, the host of the highly rated I Said No podcast on iTunes. Her coaching focuses on helping black and brown women of color define, set, and maintain healthy boundaries for themselves. I love that. I've been listening to her since, uh, what was, oh, Not Your Mama's podcast. I've been rocking like years ago, and we'll talk about that as well. In the summer of 2003, uh, Stephanie and her husband, Dennis, they tied the knot in 2010 in Montego Bay, Jamaica. Stephanie and Dennis have attended individual and couples counseling at different times, and you can both find them on Twitter, uh, and we'll give them their handles and stuff as well at the end of the show. So Brave Hearts community, let's show some love to Stephanie and Dennis. How are y'all doing this morning? Oh, man, we are doing so well. Thank you for having us, and it's an honor to be here with my baby, my husband, Dennis. We're here we're live. <laughs> That's what's up. And uh, 13 years of marriage? 13 years of marriage. This April 2024 will be 14 years. Yes, we met in 2003. Uh, so that means we've known each other for 20 years, but we didn't get married right away. Wow, that's what's up. I want to talk about that as well. Uh, let's jump into this because I want to honor your time. How did both of you meet? You want to tell my version or you want to tell your Let me version? tell my version because my version is way better, right? Okay, yeah, let, let's let's do the uh, the lit version. Yeah, yeah, let me give you my version. So, you know, I was <laughs> was working uh, uh, for a telecommunications company, and uh, it's the first time I was actually standing for a long period of, long period of time this particular day. So, I got invited to a party, and I really wasn't going to go. I was tired. I was really really fatigued. And my friend was like, "Look, it's free beer, it's free food. You're coming." And I said, "You're right. Let me just go." So. Tired as tired as I was, I went to this party and I opened the door as a friend of mine. So, you know, I just opened the door, walked in, and I saw this beautiful face sitting there. And I said, <laughs> I may have to get to know her a little bit better. I may, I may. So, you know, I started to talk to her and we exchanged numbers and the rest is history. Is that a, some good summation? I will allow that version to stand. Yes. <laughs> It was okay. a mutual friend. I had already been there. It was a party for a mutual friend's husband, birthday party. So yes, he came in and we were, the way the door was, I was sitting in eyesight of him when he opened the door. And I had actually been talking to another guy there. And he was just like, all right, whatever. I I'm going to shoot my shot. And here we are over 20 years later, still sitting next to each other, building together. That's what's up. So what was that conversation like? And when y'all first started talking for me, it was more of a, um, I was making fun of, her. let's just be honest. I, I, I came in and I wanted to, um, see if I could build a conversation with her. Like I do with most of my friends and family. And I just started just joshing on her. I looked at the, looked at a purse and called her purse fake. And she just <laughs> went, she started going off. This is fake. This is fake. I said, well, educate me. Cause I don't know. Could you put me on? See the tricks, the tricks. Now we're having a conversation. She's, educated me about her purse and i'm just like oh i didn't know that tell me more 
that led to more conversation and more intrigue. So it was a little bit of me just, uh, you know, starting conversation. Yes, he's sarcastic and funny by nature. Um, and uh, for many men, that is a comfort zone when you want to tackle difficult conversations, when the fear of rejection is in the room, you want to go to your safe place, which is normally comedy, sarcasm, and unfortunately insulting women. Um, but I will say he did it in a way where it was fun and jovial. I didn't feel disrespected. It wasn't like he was trying to, you know, do that typical thing that we tell girls, which is very damaging. If he hits you, he likes you. If he bullies he if he bullies you he likes you no it wasn't like that but it was jovial and fun and he was able to take my attention away from the other guy who was trying to talk to me and that's all she wrote we hear I had to educate him about Gucci you know he was trying to play me like oh, that's a fake Gucci bag I'm like sir let let mother school you I touched it in everything <laughs> I, I went up and was like. This don't feel like Corinthian leather. I don't think this is the same kind of leather they made. And then she had to pivot and let me know that I was completely wrong. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, Dennis, that's game, though. That's some game right there. I, I, listen, I'm subtle with mine, right? I, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm just going to do it. Pick it up. Sean, stop gassing this man, please. Damn it. <laughs> well, I was going to say, yeah, we need to pass the offering plate because, you know, Dennis giving some, some free game. That's all right. I'm going to let y'all fellas... Uh, uh, celebrate each other. Go on. Yes. Finger clap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're going to cash app. We're going to put your cash app on the bottom of the, in the description. Early. Though. Yes, sir. Early. <laughs> I want to talk about household chores real quick. Because uh, I was on Twitter probably a week ago, and I think, Stephanie, you and I spoke about getting a, a maid. Yes. And as doing some some uh, statistics, I was looking at 56 percent of marital dissatisfaction comes from household chores. Uh, how important are those duties done around in a marriage? Like, how do how do you both work with that as far as household chores? You want me to go? Yeah, you lead off with that. Um, I'd say I'll say we've grown in that area again. We met very young. So 20 years ago. We're 20, right? We're 40 now. So 20 years ago, we're 20. So we both have obviously came from different backgrounds. He's Guinean, African, and his background and his household is very traditional. The women do this, the men do that. And I'm a new Eurekan, right? So I did not come from a home where my dad was very like, oh no, that's a woman's job. My dad does everything. My dad will mow the lawn and while cornbread is baking in the oven, right? He'll do some homework while he's also making sure he's spit shining the, the furniture or the forks and knives, right? So I came from a household where I saw a man do as much as my mom. So it was jarring for me uh, once we really got together and cohabitated and shacked up before we got married to have him sit back and watch me do all of the duties in the house when he lived there as well. So that was a source of contention for us very early on in our marriage, which was also something that was focused a lot on in therapy. And how I handled it at the time was completely inappropriate because I didn't know how to handle it. So I was shaming him. I was yelling at him. I was making him feel like he was a piece of, I don't, crap, I don't want to curse here. He was a piece of crap for not participating. And I really didn't understand that it was something that he had to unlearn that was given to him in his culture, in his household. So I'll stop there and then let him add his perspective. Hey, man, I was lazy. Yeah, you know, keep it 1,000. You keep it simple. You know, I was just lazy. Uh, what am I going to? You know, see, seeing your, your dad do everything financially and don't get me wrong, everything uh, outside the house, seeing your mom do majority of the housework um you know so sub subconsciously puts you in a state where you you're thinking you know this jobs these jobs only belong to your your mate but you know therapy sit, you know going down going down with therapy and sitting down and having a conversation and just understanding that this is your house too big bro <laughs> this this is that's your dirt <laughs> that's your dish yeah. you know and i'm sitting back like that is my dish. That is my dirt. So it, it, we had to work through a we had to work through a couple of uh, conversations, a couple of scenarios where it was just like, okay, we have a hurdle. How are we going to get over this? And just 
Uh, I think I thought you, know, you mentioned therapy. I thought therapy uh, helped us out a lot with that. Yeah, I, I felt and I articulated and said, I feel like I'm your slave. And <laughs> he didn't like that that statement because, of course, that statement is overused. And mm -hmm. even though I felt taken advantage of, I'll never be a slave or an enslaved person. So it was extra in hindsight with the mental health tools I have now. I didn't have to articulate it in a way where he was my master, right? Mm. And at the time, I'm like, well, that's how I feel. And it's like, but do you really feel like an enslaved person from the 1920s? Or do you feel like you're being taken advantage of? I had to realize that I had to speak to him in the language that he could receive. I was mm. attacking him verbally and I wasn't articulating what I needed from him. So going to therapy helped that. And as I said to you on Twitter, just coming to the resolve that we can afford to pay somebody to do this and that'll help us um, alleviate some of the pressure here. And we weren't raised to outsource like that. You're not supposed to have another woman in your house cleaning for you and your man. You're not supposed to have another person cooking for you. And it's like, <laughs> why are we putting that pressure on relationships when I am not my mother? I am not my grandmother. He is not my grandfather. He is not my dad. He's not going to cheat on me with the cleaning woman. He's well, not. Don't play with me. That's what she, she, <laughs> she looks like. <laughs> He's not that person and I'm not that person, right? So understanding that we're also financially freer than our ancestors were. And we have the resources to say, hey, we're gonna hire someone. We're gonna start off once a month with deep cleaning and then we'll work on maintaining it ourselves throughout the month. And if we feel like we need to double that to bi-weekly, mm -hmm. then we will if it financially makes sense. And it helped us so much. A lot. I love that. Like you said, Stephanie, outsourcing and we are not our parents, right? So I, I love that because a lot of times, and I know for me growing up in the hood, it was like hiring a maid, you had to be rich. It was like, you was, you it know, was on bougie. different strokes or something. Yeah, it you was, was bougie. There you, go. bougie. there you go. And guess what? Black folk need to be okay with being bougie. And if that's the case, if you have a problem with the word and what it means or how you were told it was supposed to be defined, how it's supposed to uh, be received by others, one, Stop worrying about what people think about you. Do what's best for you and your household. To be okay with being the black person that can afford what other people can. Like, why is that a problem that I have? What you don't know? trauma. Breathe. We need to get it. We need to get it together and understand. A lot of our relationships are not thriving. A lot of our black marriages, a lot of our black households, our, our households of color, are, are breaking down because we're holding on to what our people from the hood, from yesteryear are telling us what it should be. And in actuality, we're taking information from people who weren't even happy themselves in the first place. We gotta let it go. Mm. You know, I love that because even outsourcing, when you're getting a maid or getting some work done to the house, you could possibly, while, they're while they are doing the work, you can land you a $5,000 client. Talk about See what it. I'm saying? It could be a client. It could be a romantic date for you two. It could be free time. When we had the maid come the first time, he had a me day. He left. I'm like, I will, I'll supervise her. I want to see how she cleans based on my liking, since that's my wheelhouse. You go and you have a great man day. Do whatever you need to do. Once we get used to her, it'll be different. But it was an opportunity for us to have separate downtime. Yeah, I, I supervised her, but I went downstairs. I read my book. I did a little bit of work. It was a Saturday morning that I got to get back for me and he got to get back for him. So whatever you do with that time, it's time you didn't have before because you were occupied cleaning the house. And we have three stories now. So it's a lot to lug that vacuum and Swiffer upstairs, downstairs, down again. It, it was just, way, it was weighing on us. So I was like, get somebody else to do it. <laughs> I know that's right, because I think we don't talk about that enough as far as uh, household chores and duties. And if we are going to outsource, um, especially if you got kids or small kids, like that's a different dynamic, right? Huge dynamic. And as a kid, I clean, too. I do believe kids should be doing chores, but also not to the degree where they are your mates. Right. Mm. That That is not. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Not to the degree where they can't have their Saturday or their personal time either. Should the family pitch in as a unit? Yes, because this is everyone's laundry. This is everybody's dirty dishes. Everyone has to eat. Sure. 
But to the extent that people cannot have downtime, take a nap, sleep in, what we're doing to our children is we're forcing them early into the workforce. And I believe there is a difference between responsibilities and oppressing our children early that become adults who hate cleaning and hate doing anything because they didn't have a chance <laughs> to spend their summers at the pool or the park. He's mowing lawns at like nine. And it's uh. like, Fine, it's hot. It's 90 degrees outside. Get somebody else to do it. I did it last week. <laughs> <laughs> hey Dennis, I feel you because I grew up the same way. Like I was, I was, uh, I was Jeffrey. I was, I was any uh, body who needed the house cleaned. I was, I was Benson. I was that servant. Benson, yeah. Listen, oh. it, it feels I'm telling my age. I'm sorry. They like Benson. No, Benson. no, no, no. Yeah, Benson. Mr. Belvedere. Benson. Benson Mr. Belvedere. Okay, yeah. hey, Jeffrey. Anyone in a suit that's. <laughs> Literally being forced to do ev any and everything. Yeah. yeah, there's a difference between teaching your children responsibilities because what we have to understand is our children grow up to be someone's husband, to be someone's wife, to be someone's father, to be someone's mother, to be someone's friend or coworker, and they're carrying these things. And then you're like, this guy is so sloppy. He doesn't want to do anything. And then you don't realize, like, he's like, I had to do everything when I was growing up. I'm exhausted. I was tired, boss. So. <laughs> So unfortunately, I got a woman now and I'm like, oh, I think she should do it on it. And I had to tell him, well, what makes you think I'm not tired? Mm. You don't look you tired. Because <laughs> you work too. Because I work too. And I work hard, just as hard as you. So this whole like, oh, gender roles, you have to cook and clean every day. And when we went in therapy, I said, you know, let's break down the ratio. How often is a woman expected to cook? That's every day, right? How often do you have to shovel snow? Mm. Yeah, I don't live in Alaska. Right. How often do you have to do the things that you're saying as a male, I'm the one who has to shovel. Or I'm the one who has to rake the leaves in the front yard. I'm not taking that from you. And I'm very appreciative that you are the person who handles that for our home. However, we're talking about maybe six times a year if there's heavy snowfall in the New York, New Jersey area versus 365 times a year. And that's if that's one meal a day. So if it's 365 mm -hmm. and you want dinner and breakfast, we're doing that times two. So you want my seven and change. I need that bacon. It just it just wasn't equating. And I just said in therapy, I need men to get really clear that it's not me invalidating what you do do for our household. I'm telling you that it's unequally yoked and unfair. My performance duties will outweigh yours all the time. And I need you to step up in that area. Cool. Cool. Bars on bars. I, <laughs> I, I totally agree. I, I, I did a video not too long ago. And we were talking about how married men are winning. Yes. You know, when you're married, like men benefit greatly from marriage. And of course, you got a lot of haters out there and, you know, stuff like that. Can you elaborate on that really quickly? Um, because I feel like that's talked about, especially by people who give great content like you. But I still don't feel like it's talked about enough. How mm -hmm. do men benefit in marriage greatly? Ooh, yeah. Hey, Dennis, I want to hear your perspective. I want to I, I want to trail off of Dennis, though, because I I, I, I want to piggyback. Hey, you know, it's, I hear you hear a lot of nonsense out there in them streets. Mm. You have to understand you, the benefit of a mate is to be able to move you through this this, this thing called uh, life and be able to. Um, we we've had constant conversations. I think we we spoke about um, what just being um, able to be uh, available, being able to be strong, independent. Um, so you're saying that being married allows you to be these things. Being married gives you a more of a sense of uh, it's like missing another crutch, if you will. Like right, it's like you need both crutches to stand straight. Does that make sense? No. It's like, he said, he said, yeah. And you said, no. Right? It's kind of like, you know, and I can, let me speak through this real quick. But the concept is you're wobbly as a single person. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wobbly. Yeah, you may do things and you get a healthy mate. You get a healthy wife, healthy man, healthy person in your life. Sky's the limit. You, your skin gets better. You learn about almond milk. Uh, 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 you, 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 you're getting, you learn about everything bagels, okay? You, 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 you're getting drapes being flown in from Chile. Like these are the things that some, some of us men aren't familiar with. We don't yeah. familiarize with some of these extra things. However, your mate is there to 
obviously be there and give you these uh these other ideas and other um ways of looking at the world. So I would say all those things um benefit men uh you know benefit men way more and and and, and we should we should be happier. Uh we should be actually saying that and letting other people know. And and I'm sure people are it's a matter, it's a matter of listening. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Be like how I get did that assist. Stephanie, I just kind of threw it assist again. Because this is your show. So yes, I love it. I love it. No matter how it's articulated, I think it needs to be articulated more when men say, This is what I got from being a, a part of this relationship, and not only the things that she does in service to you. One mm. of my issues with that question is when men answer it a lot, it's like she cooks for me, she cleans for me, and it's like, okay, you're listing her maid services, which do come with being a wife, and that's okay. One of the issues I have, and I've seen other women have when that question is answered in that way, is because I'm much more than your cleaning service, I'm much more than your cook. What have I given you emotionally? What have I given you? spiritually what have i done for you in realms that are not physical or of service because you're able to articulate yourself now that's because i'm here you're able to cry without shame because i'm here mm. so so too if you really sit back and we're talking about you know our black us black men you sit back and look at let just because there's so many little black moguls out there <laughs> right because there's so many little black moguls out there we can actually name them on our hands right but if you pay attention, majority of them were either married or on their second marriage. Mm -hmm. Majority. Jay-Z Beyonce, married. Steve Harvey, married. Kevin Hart, married. Snoop Dogg, married. Yes. So you, you're, you're going to have a marriage established while that legacy is being built. Mm -hmm. Whether you stay with the partner or not, that's one thing. However, the concept is still the same. These men are becoming who they are in a union. Talk that talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I and, love and, that. <clears throat> and how do we hear? Now that I think about it, my wife has helped me to become a better communicator. Um, because there's times I'm talking to her, I'm talking man talk, and she's like, I don't understand. I'm like, Ugh, woman, really. You know, but yeah, she's yeah. helping me to become a better communicator <laughs> and even expressing how I feel outside of just saying I'm mad right now. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm like, so sometimes when I talk to her, I'm I'm saying I'm coming to you. I'm vulnerable right now. So yes. is this a safe space for me to speak? You know, yes. so now she's listening with a different ear because I use different verbiage. Oh, I love I'm that. She's great. listening with a different ear because I use different verbiage. A lot of men are vague for various reasons. Yes, mm -hmm. historically, especially Black men, historically, there wasn't a space for you to be able to articulate yourself. You're supposed to be strong. Masculine means there's no fear. Masculine means there's no vulnerability. There's no tears, which we all know now is BS. That is that is toxic masculinity. That is patriarchal masculinity. That's not real masculinity. So what women are asking, such as your wife and myself, is for you to tap into the healthy definition of masculinity, which is respect boundaries and communication, RBCs, which is something he and I like try to bring to every conversation. If I respect you, if I have healthy boundaries, the communication has to be there as well. And we try to add those three, the RBCs, we try to add those three to everything that we do because it's necessary to give men safe spaces. And I'll land the plane on this. I want every man watching, whether you are a husband, boy, uh, young man, OG, whether you are a brother or a son, understand that safe space doesn't have to be defined as you're always right. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to be challenged. A lot of men will shut down, Sean, because their definition of safe means that they have to always be right. They can never be called up or out. And if the right woman, healthy woman loves you, she mm -hmm. is going to sometimes challenge you as the person who is the expert communicator in the relationship. Because as a life coach, you know, I'm not here to just validate you and say everybody wrong when you right. I'm also here to tell you safety also means I'm going to give you constructive, loving criticism that helps you grow. You'd be surprised uh, how many business deals are done through Pillar Talk. Oh, wow. That's that a preach. Hey, 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 babe. Uh, <laughs> I know you was talking about that business deal earlier. And uh, I think you should 
go with it. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Your wife is your partner. Your husband is your partner. And that's in every aspect of the word partner. And there are going to be times where the partnership definition shifts because now we're talking about business, but now we're talking about family and personal things. And again, RBCs, as long as you follow those three, respect boundaries and communication, and in communication means consent. And other there are other you know words you can put with the uh, letters, but respect boundary and communications. I'm telling you, Sean, those three. If you put those in start your there. conversations and start there, that will help your marriage and or committed relationship grow. I love that. Um, this is yeah. <laughs> For the sake of time, I want to I want to keep it moving because there's so much more I want to say. I'm gonna have to bring y'all back on the show. We just gotta have to do a part two then. That's it. I'm for it. So to those who are listening and watching and watching, we're going to hold Stephanie and Dennis to that. Okay. So y'all hit them up in the inbox and be like, don't worry, I'm going to have you on my platform too. So we're going to just keep it going. For sure. And uh, congratulations for bringing the podcast back, Stephanie. Cause, Thank you so much. Yeah. Cause you were like, I'm like, what is she doing? Where's my episode? Like you were in my rotation. <laughs> yes. All of a sudden you are my rotation. And I'm just yes. like, I took a mental health break. I needed it. My spirit was compromised. My mind was compromised. Uh, COVID really did a number on me. My mother was really sick, almost passed away. And I really was trying to push and force myself to coach, to speak, to podcast. And I was breaking down and I had to unplug. And initially it was supposed to be like three to six months. It was, it's been almost a year and a half. So I am back. I am rested. I am rejuvenated and I'm excited. I'm excited. Yes. Awesome, awesome. And Dennis, you have a podcast too, right? Yes, sir. Listen, NBA Whisper, if you, NBA fans, basketball fans, if you're interested in knowing what's really going on, not the, the, the stuff on the media, come to me, the NBA Whisper, Sir Denny Blanco. Yes, I uh, do a show. It's called It's in the Game podcast with Randy J. Crew. Shout out to Randy. And we discuss many things, trades, uh, NBA uh, news, but we just get straight to the uh, truth in the business. Thank you. Did you see that thing with Ryan Davis when he was talking about Kevin Durant? I don't want to get off sidetrack, but did you hear no, about no. that, Dennis? Yeah, wait, he made, what did he say about Kevin Durant? Just to just to be he sure. He dragged him. Yeah, he got yeah, he dragged Kevin Durant. Basically, he was saying that um he's balding. And on top of that, he can't he he's a offensive scorer, but he was like a lot of those guys who are champions, they have defensive um uh, uh accolades like jordan and pippen yes, and all those yes, guys because yes, kevin right. durant was saying something about scoring win championships and he was like nah it's deeper than that listen me and kevin have a love-hate relationship he doesn't know me which is fine but you know i like to when i speak on these shows i like to speak like this person sitting right in front of me so i don't have to you know be scared if i see them again i would say <laughs> kevin I would say, Kevin, you're one of the greatest scorers I've ever seen play a basketball game in my life. Um, but I think some of the moves that some of the trades that you've uh, requested, requested a trade from Golden State after you win a championship, requesting a trade from Brooklyn and then going to Phoenix. I think some of the trades are a little off. They're just a little confusing for me. But other than that, I'm not taking it away from your beautiful uh, jump shot, the ability to do a lot for a seven footer. I'm not taking away none, none of that away from you. But hey. Defense wins championships. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. I love when he talks basketball. He gets so, he like turns on. Does his light switch just like starts to beam? You press the button. Press the button. You dial them up. That's his favorite. Press the button. <laughs> hey, that's what's up. Make sure you check out that video. <clears throat> it is, it's crazy. No, I'm definitely, so yeah, Kevin Durant right. hate. I'll just put Kevin Durant hate in the, in the algorithm. It'll come up. Yeah, <laughs> pop up first. <clears throat> Other than sex, how do you both connect um, through intimacy? What, what are some things that you do? Um, intimate wise take it listen i've been having conversations with this young lady about intimacy and i i be honest with you ladies and gentlemen boys and girls i i need help i i am lacking in that in that area and we have constant conversations about what i can possibly do and they're you know because it's fresh i could just be glad to just go on and say because literally had this conversation you had it last night yeah like literally you know um not seeing it in the home you know, my 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 family she said Ghani and my family um very emotionally cold. Okay. So vac no vacations, no intimacy, nothing I, I have seen. Yet I see movies, I see TV, so I see an idea of what it is. So um 
it's been a hurdle for me in, the, in these 20 years. It's been a hurdle. Doesn't, mm-hmm. doesn't mean that I don't love her. Doesn't mean that I don't uh, appreciate who she is. It just means I need to do a little bit more uh, just to let her know that um, I cherish her and uh, that she is uh, special. So, yeah. So for me, it's just a matter of uh, getting better. So I just got to push through hesitancy. That's probably for me. These are the conversations I want to hear and the questions I want men to ask. How do you, what you said, how do you, do you have intimacy without sex? A lot of men think that that's the only way to be intimate physical connection and unfortunately for a lot of men as he said it wasn't demonstrated for them and when they did try to do it they got told they were a simp or you were r and you know you call <laughs> people all the stuff we like to put on men when they're trying to be a ronnie romance kind of guy 90s r and me all day baby i want that vibe i want that feeling and we just had this conversation as he said yesterday and it's not about not not having physical touch. It's about not putting emphasis on penetration. It's about making your wife feel like she matters past you pumping and dumping on her or past her sitting on top of you. Um, and that is intimacy. But what about during the day checking on her, right? Those are small bids of attention that people want for women. And I know people have heard it millions of times before. Sex for a woman starts way before the clothes come off. We want to feel cherished throughout the day. Your job is not only to protect and provide for me in the typical common financial sense, right? And in the safety sense, fight for me. You're supposed to also protect and provide for me in an intimate way. Protect me from having the idea of looking at another man because he's giving me what you're not. Provide for me in a way where even when he does slide in my DMs or I do see him on a train or whatever, I'm not even interested because Mm -hmm. you're providing all the things that I need to feel sexy and desired and wanted. Um, But what I will say also is you asked the initial question, what do we do? We laugh a lot. Mm -hmm. As you can see, we're joshing and we hang out. And I think fun is underrated in relationships. Him talking about what he needs to do better in is more of the traditional sense of intimacy and romance, which is like candle lights and stuff like that. But he's very intimate in other ways. And that's what I want men and women to know as well. Intimacy doesn't have to look like a rom-com. Though those are great, the bubble baths and the rose petals and surprising you in the hotel rooms and those things are done up, which he has done. It's a matter about doing it more, Mm -hmm. not resting on the thing you're good at. You're great with bringing her flowers. Okay, what else? Mm-hmm. Right, just like she shouldn't be giving you do rag sex all the time and, and 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 not wearing lingerie, right? It's on the flip side too. If he needs to be satisfied in a way where he's a visual creature, so do we. So finding ways that you feel desired past intercourse and past anything sexual to me is really important. So what I'm learning as a wife is it's not that he's not highly intimate or romantic. His way of being romantic is different. And he just needs to learn to speak my romance language just a bit more so that we both have satis- satisfaction. Because mm-hmm. a lot of women tend to be like, he doesn't do this. And it's like, no, no, no. It's not that he doesn't do it. He just doesn't do it in the way you would like it. So how about you start to respect and appreciate how he does it and then he dials yours up more. So there's a nice cold hybrid situation happening there. Preach. Mm-hmm. Church. I love that. <laughs> Church. <laughs> That's a word because one, because I've learned over time, <clears throat> like you're saying, Stephanie, you know, that intimacy looked different for different people. And like you said, with Dennis, it can be laughter. Right. And I've learned over time because I told, well, what I do now is I, t- I send my wife a text message, not every day. And I got drugged through the mud on Twitter for this. And people's calling me a simp, it went viral. It was crazy. And I asked, I <clears throat> told my wife, what can I do today to make you feel loved? Yes. I send her that text every so often and people is coming for me. If you know her, why do you got to ask? No, no, because people change and grow every day. And what I needed last Monday, I might need something different. Whatever happened at work with my family, with myself as a woman, even just going through her cycle every month, every month I need something different right? Depending on what happened to me in transit from work to home, depending on what my mom needs, depending on what he needs, every day will be different. It doesn't mean I'm schizophrenic. It means I'm human having a human experience. So for a man to realize like she might not like the sunflowers or need the sunflowers I bought her last week, I want to ask her how I can show her this week. That means you're very present. And I'd rather you go viral for being a simp than go viral for being an F-boy. 
Preach. <laughs> really? That a preach. That's a bar. <laughs> Can you tell us a tough time y'all experienced in marriage and how did y'all get through it? Therapy. Therapy. Tough time. Therapy. Any time, but there's been two tough times, but at the same time, too, it was um the concept was pretty simple. We need it's I mean, do, can we say a therapist is a referee? Yes. Is that good? Is that, yes. Is that, a, is that a fair statement? Fair statement, babe. Like if yep. we got to a point where it was like, look, look, look. It's not commu- we're not communicating. <laughs> so it makes me shy. I'm just it's like, like we're, not, we're just we're just saying things and it's like ooh, it's not hitting. We weren't fighting fair. It's not hitting. So we actually got in front of some people and had conversations. And you'd be surprised when there's a referee. How Dennis, the con- Dennis, hold on, please, because that will preach. I love that. You need a referee, your therapist, because it can be, you know, y'all playing, right? Y'all, sometimes y'all, we can be opposite teams, right? Yes. Basketball reference. Dennis, you might get called for a travel. And the referee got to stop. Dennis, you traveling. Turn yep. over. Yep. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you're, no, you're, no you're on it. it. You're it's, on it. It's, 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 you're on it. And that's the thing where <laughs> imagine you have two, you have two teams there's a travel violation. You have two coaches yelling at each other because the referee, obviously, two coaches are yelling at the referee because the referee either made a good call or a bad call. Mm-hmm. So here I am. Here we are, excuse me, in this therapy session. OK, Dennis, this is where you can do better. Yeah. OK, Stephanie, this is where you can do better. Do you want to? Stay there. But do you want to? Mm. is huge because the whole justification Sean of character mm. flaws and this is just who I am <laughs> and you met me like this <laughs> gonna have a lot of people single and or divorced or still together and very unhappy and mm. it was a matter of do I want to do this differently like j- had to sit back and ask myself This is how I've always spoken to him. Do I want to change how I speak? Is what he means to me worth it? And if the answer is no, that's okay. Leave the relationship. You cannot sit in a relationship and have a referee and still decide that the referee don't know what they're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) We had a beautiful therapist named Judy, a white Jewish lady who knew nothing about our culture. And it was phenomenal to have um, someone who was non-biased, who didn't know us from anything and just heard us speak and air out our grievances. And yes, she took her notes and she would just calmly be like, so Stephanie, um, was it necessary to say it that way? Dennis, maybe she'll be relieved if you stop whatever, whatever. She was just very clear, very concise and really called us up and out. And sometimes those drives home from therapy were very quiet. It's very all quiet. It was only a 10 minute ride, but it felt like an hour. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it caused us to have conversation and spark dialogue. So referees to me are necessary. It helped us. And I don't even remember what we were going through at that point. It's just you you, you did when you're with someone, history is there, you run into some hurdles and some trials and tribulations. And then the concept is do you actually want to work on these or do you, do you just them? want them? Do you want these things to fester and then just get to a point where you just wake up and be like, I don't even want to see this person's face. Yeah. Uh, so we got to a point where we wanted to take a step, have somebody talk, you know, have somebody in front of us while we're sharing, um, sharing information. And she gave us some tools. Yeah. Mm. And what people ask me is like, well, you're a life coach. Why would you have to go to therapy? Why do you go to individual therapy? Why? You should know. And I'm like, it's not my job in a relationship to carry all the emotional weight. What I got credential for and the gift God gave me, yes, I do use it sometimes in our marriage. But guess what? He's not my patient. He's not my client. And I shouldn't over-therapize or, you know, bring everything I learned to the relationship. That's not fair to him. And it's not fair to me because I need an outlet as well. And I don't trust any coach or therapist who does not have a coach or a therapist. I don't trust anyone who doesn't feel like that, who feels they're above reproach when it comes to mental and emotional health. No. Mm, Reach. That's a, that's a word. Cause I was saying the other day, I guess I'm kind of rabbit trails, but it's amazing how many people want to be coaches, but they will never pay for a coach. 
<laughs> say it again. I said, you, say it again. You want people to believe in you as a coach. And credentialing is important. Getting your certifications and your license and your master's if you're going to be therapists and so forth and so on. Yes, that's important. But investing in yourself so that you can be the person that the clients need is paramount because how can I coach you when I don't understand coaching from the client perspective? Child, don't get me started. Move on. <laughs> Move on now. <laughs> I want to uh, ask this question. How do you think married couples should have individual therapists and a, a marriage therapist? hundred percent. I knew he was going to point at me a hundred percent. We were, before he started individual therapy, we had the couples therapy. And I told him, I felt like he was using our couples therapy as his individual therapy. And I wasn't fair to the couple session. And I didn't even tell Judy, the therapist at the time that I was feeling that way. We go to a session and it somehow was woven in the session discussion. And she said, I completely agree. And it shouldn't be me. She said, I can recommend some people. You need an outlet just to be Dennis, relieve little Dennis's trauma, uh, speak about her freely. Because, yeah, we're speaking freely in therapy, but you're still having RBC, the respect and boundaries, because you don't want to say certain things that will backfire, right? You might say them, but you'll say them on eggshells. Or even if they're not eggshells, you're saying it respectfully. In your own individual session, if you want to wild out, only you and your therapist know that, right? If you want to call her out her name, if you want to be like, she just like her mama and I can't stand her mama, you're allowed to do that when she's not around. And, you know, at first he was a little annoyed. Mm -hmm. Like, what? I'm finally going to therapy. You're going to tell me. And when she told him, he finally was like, okay. And then he got into therapy and he fell in love with it. <laughs> Yes. Yes. That's what's up. Uh, yeah, I love it because people used to question. They 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 thought my wife and I was crazy. They're like, "What y'all doing with all these therapists?" I'm like, "No, you need yeah. your individual therapist." Like you said, Stephanie, if you need to wild out or you feel like you don't have to walk on eggshells and deal with your little kid issues, yeah. yes. you know that's what that individual is for. And then when yeah. you do get into the marriage, you can talk about as a unit. Absolutely. And I wish more issues. people would do that. Um, I didn't know what I didn't know. In hindsight, 20 years ago, when even when he proposed to me years later, we would not have gotten married unless we had couples counseling and individual counseling. Of course, we were 20. We didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. And though I knew as a church kid, I'm a pastor's kid, though I was raised that you should have premarital counseling before marriage, it was church based. And because I saw what I saw as a pastor's kid, I didn't trust it. Mm. Right. Because there was a lot of counseling happening in the church for marriages by uncredentialed deacons, pastors and ministers that you can't be telling me by the word of God when what you're basically telling me. And again, love God, believe in God, all that. But a lot of the Bible is sexist and a lot of it is geared towards um, submitting to a man that does not submit to you. Right. And there were a lot of people being cheated on and hurt and violated. And it's just like, no, pray about it. I didn't subscribe to it because of what I saw as a pastor's kid. In hindsight, now that I know actual credential beings do this, <laughs> and it's not just in your church, there's no way I would advise marriage without individual and couples counseling with a minimum of six months to a year first, before you plan one thing about the wedding. Yeah, I mean, if we had a Thanos snap and we gave the ability to uh, 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 have that anyone could have uh, therapy, yeah. How better would the world be mm -hmm. if uh, before you were allowed to get married, you had to you had to get therapy, a couple's therapy before you actually went in? What if exactly. how better would the world be? And not just go to therapy, Sean, and you'll see this if you haven't already with your clients, not just go to coaching and sit there. Do the work. I'm talking about participate. Do the work. I have fired clients, Sean, because I felt like they were just showing up to complain. And then when I challenge them or give them homework assignments, you're coming back and you didn't do your homework. You only got one or two times with that for me, for me to be like, I'm not your coach. This is not the type of life coaching I do. I am serious about my coaching. I am serious about transforming lives. Um, and if you're not really going to actually do the work, but people like to be performative, Sean, they like to say, especially now because pop therapy and pop psychology is so big. I am in therapy. I got a life coach. Ooh, my life coach is the same life coach on the housewife show. That's my girl. And it's like, but are you doing the actual work? So not just go to therapy. I would definitely recommend you go to individual and coaching, uh, therapy together separately, minimum six months to a year.
I love it. That's good. Because one thing that I, I've noticed over time is a lot of marriages and, and congratulations on the, the longevity, like sticking it out. Because by today's culture, people, they will drop you in a New York minute. And I said most relationships today are, well, back in the day when we were growing up, to my age, we used to actually fix stuff, right? Yeah. Something was broke, we fixed it. And we rock with that thing until the wheels fall off, whether if it was a bike, a toy, or oh. whatever. Yeah, car, right? We working on it. But nowadays, yeah. we just Amazon. You know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I, I call it uh I call it for some of my so thank you. Thank you, lady. You're Appreciate welcome. you. Appreciate you kindly. I call it um uh, for some of us black men out there, some of us. It's three things we uh, usually run into, some of us black men. Sloppiness, laziness, and stupidness. SLS. SLS is what I've deemed that. Yes. Yeah. The lazy is, you know, coincides with, you know, I don't want to fix it. I don't even want to raise my hand to fix fix whatever is broken. I don't even want to use the energy I have to fix it. It'll just be whatever it is. Some of us men are very lazy when it comes to our relationships, uh, it, which, is, which is interesting because you could be so strong in your career, but then so strong in your basketball tournaments, yes. but then terrible in your relationship with your lady. Yeah. So it's very interesting how some of us can't multitask or compartmentalize. Or prioritize. Or properly. prioritize, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's about prioritizing what matters most, what's most important. That basketball game and that career won't be at your deathbed. It's it's really about prioritizing what matters most. And I love that men are career driven because yes, you're supposed to provide. But again, providing is not just your paycheck. You're supposed to provide my love. You're supposed to provide my security in intimacy, in feeling like you're communicating with me. It's so much deeper than rap, Sean. Being, it's balance, it's balance. Being a husband and a wife is so much deeper. And you mentioned 13 years and congratulating us. And I appreciate that because you're right. Our older generation stuck it out. This generation is microwave. I think we need to find a hybrid because there are a lot of people in our generation who should not have stuck it out. And then there's a lot of people now who need to work a little harder. So if we can find a healthy balance, and I believe that starts with a spirit of discernment, mm -hmm. is this worth me sticking it out? Has their needle has the needle moved where I can see that there's been a change in him and in me? One of the reasons that we're still here and maybe tell me if you agree is because, like we said last night, what we're fighting about is fixable. It's a matter of, like I said earlier, do you want to? And if you don't want to love me enough to tell me the truth so that I can make an informed decision that separates me from the hurt that I'm feeling that you're causing. Mm. Bing bong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good because I realized like with Amazon, it's just like, oh, it's broken. We just order one and it's on our doorstep the next day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm wait till y'all see this video. If y'all listen to this via podcast, you got to see the video. The video is priceless. Then he but got props. <laughs> got props. The you know, we just like that with relationships. Yeah. We know we don't want to fix it. We just Order it on Amazon. We it just order, order somebody on social media, right? Oh, I like her. I like him. I'm going to replace them. And next thing you know, they show up on your doorstep. 24 hours later, you got a new man or a new woman. So yes. rarely do we want to fix things. And I think that's something that I love in our old school uh, generation as far as fixing things and seeing things through instead of just trying to replace somebody. I just want people to know that fixing things doesn't mean sweeping it under the rug. A lot of our old school generation didn't fix anything. They just were quiet about it. Daddy got a whole family down the block. We just not going to talk about it and act like we don't see them kids. Mm. Mommy emasculates daddy. So we just going to say happy wife and happy life and be on eggshells until mommy feels better. All of that was not fixing. It was actually unhealthy. So while I agree with you, I think it's really important to be clear and distinct about what was fixing, mm -hmm. where things were changing, growing and evolving versus we just quiet as black folk. And it's like, don't tell my business in this house. Mm -hmm. We just gonna be unhappy in this house. But when we go outside, we putting on them church hats, them Easter clothes and everybody think that we the best family on the block. Okay, cause my collard greens are hitting. There's a difference, there's nice. a difference. A lot. Yeah. Yeah, right. No, thanks for the clarity. I appreciate that. Cause I'm sure somebody gonna be in the comments and Sean told me to, to, to fix it. 
So thanks, <laughs> thanks for the clarity. Now, if you're in domestic violence situations, you know, disclaimers, unfortunately, Sean, are necessary because people have the right to perceive things the way they do. Um, disclaimers are important, especially in our line of work. We're not telling anyone to stay in a situation where they are physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and financially being abused or their children. We're saying evaluate your spirit of discernment, evaluate your self-worth, your self-abandonment actions, and see who you are, not just what he's doing or she's doing. What role are you playing? And if you're playing a role that is fixable and vice versa and fixable in a healthy way, not masking it with alcohol, not getting a side piece, not going to church more and thinking that's better because you're hiding in the house of the Lord. That's a separate conversation. Um, but doing it where you guys are coming together and having the healthy dialogues like you and I and Dennis are having right now and getting a healthy credentialed referee, AKA therapist and or life coach. She good. I she love good. that. I love that. Hey, Ken Kendrick Lamar said it best. He said, you ain't felt pain until you felt you're sober. So, Talk about it. Come on, Kendrick. It's a yeah, word. I know, right? That's a yeah. bar. Let's jump into this bonus round real quick because I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, Dennis, I'll start with you first. What's the biggest mistake you see men make in relationships? Yeah, didn't I say lazy? <laughs> biggest mistake? Let me see. Biggest mistake. Is there just one? Uh, I've been to two. Wow, big bro. Uh, <laughs> but you can run with as many as you want. But you know what? what okay, do you think? I mean, I'll go through a couple. Um, I mean, never assume. Hmm. Never assume. Uh, that's one of the things that I think are a lot of mistakes. Assume um, being lazy. Um, and men, it, it's okay to share your ideas, and it's okay to to speak if the person on the other side is not receiving what you're relaying out, it's okay to say, you know what, I'm gonna take a step back and, you know, reevaluate some things. It's okay. Another thing, rejection, terrible, mm. horrific. The way it's handled, you mean? Thank you. Just clarifying, baby. No, all good. I got you. Terrible, terrible. We, we, we just, we, some of us have a problem with rejection and, that doesn't help us in building some strong, healthy relationships um, that hinders us. But that's a couple. That's just a couple. I don't want to. We could be here all day. <laughs> the men making all kind of mistakes. huh? <laughs> so I'm, hey, you said men. So I want to leave it on man because, listen, we ain't talking about the woman now. Leave it on the man. Okay. And that's why I want to go to Stephanie now. Stephanie, what do you think are the biggest one of the biggest mistakes you see women make in relationships? I think one out of several mm -hmm. is thinking that we don't have anything to work on. It's always the man's fault. I see you both in agreement. If you're listening to this, like Sean said, you need to see the video, honey. They was just in a worship moment just now. As a woman who coaches black and brown women and mm -hmm. as being one herself and coming historically from a line of women who were emasculating, who were aggressive, who were strong in the healthy and unhealthy sense, whether they had to be or not, watching men be emasculated, watching women break vows that had nothing to do with cheating, but yet putting all the emphasis only on cheating, acting as if all of the other, again, RBCs, the respect, the boundaries, and the communication didn't matter. It seems that women, some women feel that everything about the breakdown in a relationship is always a man's fault. I see women weaponizing their children against fathers who don't want to be with you, yet they want to be with their children. I see women emasculating men every day that's not even their man and wondering why mm. they don't have a man or have a healthy man. There are so many things that women put on men at times. Excuse me, some women. I keep saying some because I don't like generalizing. I think that's some. another I think that's another issue too. It's all men ain't S -I S H I T. Okay all this and it's like no it's the man you know the man you chose to lay down with the man you chose to have a baby with maybe it's your daddy and your uncle but it's not all man because the man i'm sitting next to he is something he is something so it's not all man the man that's on the screen talking to me interviewing me he is something so it's not all men um those two right there are really powerful because if you're constantly the victim in a relationship you will never ever ever take accountability and look inward Mm. And again, disclaimer, disclaimer, this is not for women who are constantly dogged and who have been violated and hurt by men, because there are men, excuse me, boys in adult flesh that are trash out here. Even with that, I question, why are you participating 
in a relationship where you are not valued, worthy, and cherished. Mm. So for me, a lot of women, including myself, had to stop being the finger pointer mm -hmm. and realize that these three were pointing at me. And if I'm here in a partnership, partnership is not only healthy. I'm here at participating in toxicity in partnership as well. It takes two to tango in health and takes two to tango in un unhealthiness. Mm. I would love our Black community to reestablish the word accountability. Amen. Oof. I would love our black community Preach. to reestablish what talk. it means when it's accountability. So for men, black men, Oof. you want to yell at this woman that has your child mm. that is not on your same page, sir. You have to be accountable for who you deal with and what you do with that situation. There are scenarios where people are just avoid of accountability. Mm -hmm. Thus, we're just in the spiral of just yep. negativity. I agree. Yep. I agree. I think accountability I can be for both ends where it's like, what are we doing wrong? Accountability and being okay with accountability, meaning someone's letting you know that you could do better. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that we can check black men all the time, but black men can't check us. We could tell a black man he got to go to therapy. We could tell a black man he lazy. He needs to help around the house. But your black man can't get you up at 6 a.m. and be like, we doing a workout? Your black man can't say, hey, babe, when you on the phone with your family, you're gossiping a lot. And then when you get off the phone with them, it's negativity in this household. Is there a way you can participate in your family stuff that doesn't hinder our relationship? You're treating me like your sister's baby father. And it hurts me every time you get off the phone with her. Like, I don't understand. Why is it that a partnership when it comes to betterment is only us to them when it can't be them to us? You can I'm call me sorry. pick me all you want, but let me tell you, I don't get picked. I've been chosen. So there's no pick me here. I'm just spilling the hot tea. Okay. Ooh, you about to have me speaking in tongues over here. She told about shots. Hey. Hey. Oh my god. Yes. Ooh, that's a real. We need to just make that little segment into a real and just drive. And just yeah, let's let's, let's, let's make that a thing now. This is a segment that's going to be the real that we're going to share for for promotion. Okay, like <laughs> for sure. Oh my God, that's a word. It is a word. We need to do better as women. Again, saying you need to do better as a woman is not negating where men need to do better and vice versa. We are so conditioned to tennis match and ping pong it back to the other person. And no one wants to sit, i.e. accountability, as Zenny said. Accountability sits. It marinates. It processes. It doesn't mm. just be like, oh, oh <laughs> block me. I can't. Ping it back to what the men are doing. Let men talk to men about being better. And let us women talk to each other about being better. And then when we have a healthy accord, then let's come together. Again, personal therapy, then couples therapy. Then let's come together as couples and as sexes and work it out together. Oh, I love that. That is, yeah, I can't wait for this video to come out. Because I wonder, does anyone have a shirt that says accountability isn't a curse word? Does anybody have that shirt? No, but you just made your new merch line and I'm buying <laughs> and I'm wearing. Yes, accountability is not a curse word. Accountability is not derogatory. Accountability does not mean that you're a bad person. And there's so many negative connotations to ownership words and pop therapy will have you calling everybody toxic but yourself and unfortunately we're walking around at times not really taking accountability of we're not the men and women we think we are come on we're not i know i haven't always been he's raising his hand he hasn't always been the present respect boundaries and communication man that he's supposed to have been i haven't always been that woman and it takes a real mature emotionally intelligent person sean to be like, if 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 I want mercy and grace, mm. don't I have to give it? Child, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Mic <Mike> drop. <laughs> From seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage, Dennis? Seeing my parents' relationship, what did it teach me about marriage? Uh, consistency uh, is important. Um, my parents are consistent. Yeah. Uh, they're very consistent and they're very, um, it's like years, just, uh, they've been together forever, long time. forever, like 50 years, 50 years. They've been together really? Wow, yeah. 50 years. Yeah. They've been together for a very, very long time. And you mentioned that earlier. Steph mentions earlier, you know, it's like 
you ask these folks that have been with each other for 50 years, you ask them, you know, ask my mom, were you happy? And she'll give she an answer. She said, what's happiness? <laughs> I said, girl, I don't want that. <laughs> she said, what's happy? She did. She said, what's happy? You kids want to be happy? I was like, I do. <laughs> this conversation about happiness and duty and, you know, what you're what you're supposed to do. So yeah, seeing my parents um, just taught me consistency. I mean, this, this young lady is wondering why I'm pulling out chairs and pulling out doors and pulling out. Yeah, you, you was like, what's wrong with you? Why are you I, running? Hold on. I asked you what's wrong with you just because you're chivalrous. I demand nothing but, so I don't know what you mean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Doors open. Everything my dad did for my mom, I yeah. did. I did for the lady in my life. Yeah. Um, and you know, even and that's the funny thing with the chivalry and everything that comes with it. Even with uh, ladies that didn't appreciate it, mm. still did it anyway. Why? Because my dad did it for my mom. So that's what I learned a little bit. Of. And that's one of my favorite things about him being chivalrous. I. From what he told me and other men have told me, you can tell that that's, I, I would accept nothing less. And I didn't even have to ask for it. It's just who he was. And when I met his parents, I understood it. When I went to Ghana, his dad was, if, 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 if they needed to put the jacket on the floor so I could walk over a puddle, that's the kind of men they are. Very old school and chivalrous. And his father is consistent in being that guy for every woman around him. Granddaughter, daughter-in-law, wife. That's just who they are. And it's a beautiful thing. Mm, I love that. So, uh, Stephanie, I'm going to ask you the same question. From seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage? It taught me a few things, some healthy and unhealthy. Mm -hmm. It taught me that marriage has to have accountability, right, on both ends. And it also taught me what I just demonstrated to you, uh, excuse me, said to you. I saw a lot of you, my mom saying what my dad needs to work on, but my dad not saying anything my mom needs to work on. And just allowing her to, you know, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> allowing her to be vocal about things she's unhappy. Women are natural communicators. We're going to talk. We're going to over talk and wonder why men don't speak. Um, and though she had valid points and still does at times, I just noticed my dad would just fall back and let it happen. And mm. to me, that wasn't healthy. Whether she was speaking respectfully or not, she was just the one who communicated vices versus or issues versus him. And I wasn't sure if that was something that I wanted. I wanted a man to speak and I love my dad. He's the best. And I tell him, you know, there are times you operate in toxic positivity. Mm. You know, everything's fine. I'm the man. I'm supposed to take it. I'm like, no, that happy wife, happy life is unhealthy. I hate that statement. I don't subscribe to it. So that's one thing I learned that wasn't really something I wanted to take into my marriage. But also I learned how to cherish my dad. Oh my God. He cherishes my mom. My mom will claw someone's eyes out for my dad. They are very much about them. Like that's my girl. That's yeah. my guy. My mom was sick and oh, I'm getting emotional. He couldn't get in the ambulance with her. He drove behind the ambulance the whole way. Like, there's just during COVID. So, during COVID when everyone is home and no one's supposed to be outside, COVID wouldn't allow him in the ambulance. And he's just like, they're like, oh, you could stay or go home or meet us at the hospital. He's like, I'm not meeting you anywhere. I'm driving behind you. Don't lose me because mm. I need to make sure the road to her healing, I'm on it. Mm. it oh, I could cry just thinking about that. That's the kind of cherishing I want. And that made me call him up about certain things because I had a man demonstrate for me. This is why fatherhood is so important. Mm. I had a man demonstrate for me how a woman should be cherished. Again, he was out there mowing the lawn, but he was also doing homework, helping me sew a patch in my shirt and cooking <laughs> cornbread. I had a man who was not emasculated by doing feminine things. Mm. Nurturing his children was not gay. Nurturing his children wasn't being sent. It wasn't just about him giving us money or punishing us. So I saw that in a marriage and I said, that's the kind of man I want. I want a man who's funny and I want a man who puts me on the pedestal that I deserve to be put on. And I saw my mom take that and be like, I never had that before. And I'm not mad about being someone that someone wants to cherish because she had a lot of trauma in her childhood and mm. it took a while for her to find a man who put her on the pedestal she deserved to be put on. So, yeah. 
Love it. Good stuff. Last question, because I want to respect your time. No, no uh, trick answer or whatever you feel is best. Dennis, is it easier to love yourself or someone else? Can I say your questions are fantastic? Come on, like, now. honestly, I love Come on now. That's easy for me now because there's a lot of people loving themselves and not loving, not having the ability or the mental bandwidth to love outside themselves. Loving themselves is easy. Well, my opinion. Yeah, he yeah, actually loving myself is easier. You know, I ain't got to rely on some. Listen, take me to an NBA basketball game. Listen, I like to, I like some oxtails. Buy me some oxtails. You know, I don't have to worry about none of that. I just do it myself. Yeah. That's why this. Such a man. Yeah, that, that's. <laughs> That's why these people, that's why these relationships aren't working because you, you got people that's like, I'm not as selfless as I possibly could. Mm. So it's not going to work. Hmm. Mm. For me, mm. it's easier to love other people. Other people. Break it down. Um, I'm my worst critic. And many people are that way. They pour into people what they can't even give to themselves. Mm. And a lot when my clients ask me, how do I, how do I speak kinder to myself? How do I love myself? I often say, if you see a baby right now in a swaddle on the street, what are you gonna do? Or an animal, something that you love that you believe should be, what are you gonna do? They're like, oh my God, I would pick it up, I would tell it it's gonna be okay. I would probably give it something to eat, I would clean it. I'm like, so you would nurture it back to health and life. That's what you need to do to yourself. So I say that to say that most people can't or don't give it to themselves. It's easy to give it to other people. And I would say I'm a hybrid, depending on the mental and emotional and spiritual season I'm in. There are times where it's harder for me to love myself. So I have seasonal depression, uh, seasonal affective disorder. During the colder months, I'm very depressed and I have to fight through it to even, you know, participate in life. Those seasons, that season for me, it's harder for me to be kind to myself. I can pour into other people because it takes the focus off my depression. Um, mm. But when it's summer and now and we outside, I'm loving myself because I gotta, you know, I gotta be outside doing things. We be rolling in the streets. So, you know, it depends for me. I'm not a type of person where it's, everything is the same for me all the time. I evolve with life. Mm -hmm. I love that. Ah, okay. Y'all got a couple minutes because I just got to ask y'all. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. okay. I got to ask y'all this question because y'all, y'all, y'all spitting gems. I'm loving it. Okay, which is the hardest for you to say, Dennis? <clears throat> is it A, I apologize. B, I need help. C, I love you. Or D, I was wrong. I need help. Okay. I need help. Yeah. Well, Those other ones. They they up they there, up, up. yeah. You know I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they up there. Yeah, you know I mean, saying sorry if I if I know I'm right, if I feel I'm right, I got the strong. You know, what I mean? but no, um, no, that that's that's my. I answer. think that's fair. Yeah, that's that's my answer. For me, it's I'm sorry. Mm. I don't do lip service. If I'm not genuinely sorry, I'm not saying it. Mm. I'm an action person, so you can say sorry, but if your actions don't reflect it. Of course, I have to give you grace and time to change. But if time goes and it's like, I feel you're doing the same thing to me, your words were irrelevant. Mm -hmm. However, in therapy, that's what I had to learn. We have different apology styles and apology languages. He needs mm -hmm. the words. Mm -hmm. But I feel at time I'm disingenuous when I have to process and be like, what did I actually do wrong? Because a lot of people say, sorry, Sean, just to get access to the benefit of you again. They that's don't really... Word. Listen, we when we watch this back, we're going to write down a few words and just have episodes just about those topics, right? Oh, um, yeah, people want to re, re, relive or reignite or get the access to you back that they lost because you're hurt and you're distant. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's really important not to just want the access to him back. Mm -hmm. It's really important for me to honor honor our relationship to process and say, what did you really do wrong? Or are you just saying sorry to him so we could just move on? Mm, so for me, that. I'm sorry is the hardest. I'm not always right with the processing because sometimes his wound needs suturing early. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm working on not seeing it as only lip service, seeing it as giving him what he needs in the moment and trying to dissociate, disassociate the disingenuous feeling I have around it let me pick and also picking you back on um not asking for help um mm -hmm. us yeah, black i wanted to ask you about that dennis i wanted you to go in detail yeah us black men you know um i didn't see my dad ask for help too much 
Mm. I ain't seen nobody offer offer an extended hand. Mm. Reach out and touch somebody's <laughs> hand. Like he's just handless. Yeah. <laughs> nobody, you know, so I'm just like, okay, I'm going through life thinking, yeah, nah, it's all on you, guy. Like mm. it's all on you. And then you have ladies come into your life, your wives, and they tell you, look, no, I'm I'm here. Talk to me. Ah, sounds good. No, I don't, I don't believe you. Mm. I don't believe you. I had to go to therapy. I had to sit down and speak to somebody and have people ask these questions. Like, why don't you believe that someone's willing to help you? Why don't you think that this person that's been here for X amount of time, that's always seen things through for you. Why would you think this person is not going to help you? Mm. You know, so it was, a, it was a, a thing where I had to sit and actually ask myself through therapy why I have this hurdle. Yeah. Now I ask her for help for everything, right? Yes. <laughs> you tie my, tie my sneakers. Yes. Tell me. <laughs> joke, joke, you know, joke. Trauma has a language, Sean. Trauma has, trauma speaks for us. Trauma listens for us. Trauma receives for us. So when we carry on the not asking for help and not being willing to apologize. That is our trauma speaking for us in our relationships. It's not even us. It's the the carry, the historical carrying on of the trauma that we're choosing to speak. And so many of us are in relationships and have yet to even meet our partners yet. We've only been associated. We sleep with, we cook for their trauma and we haven't even met them yet. Mm, that's mm -hmm. good. Yeah, because you can tell when someone trauma is speaking, you're like, yeah, I, I can hear that. Yeah, because you know? yeah. because because heal heal people here differently, right? So Jesus, yes, yes. <laughs> trauma will meet you. Trauma is the loudest person in the room. Trauma is the person who wants all the attention. Trauma is very reactive. Trauma doesn't process. Trauma is like who want it, when, how, what. Trauma Shanene from Martin just come <laughs> out, the, just come out the apartment ready to fight, right? Just always ready to be on defense. Trauma is not offense. We have the sports metaphors. Trauma is defense all the time. I said, I said, I said, I said, I'm sorry, Dennis. I said, I'm sorry. Did you? Did you really? I mean, do you mean it? I'm trying to hear it. Trauma <laughs> doesn't believe healthiness. Trauma doesn't believe wholeness. Trauma believes there's also another shoe that's always going to drop. Trauma doesn't think that goodness is supposed to be here and it's going to stay around. Trauma thinks it's only short lived. And to some degree, if you're some, with someone traumatic as well, yeah, most likely that's what's going to happen because you're repeating these traumatic Cycle. cycles over and over every month with the same arguments or this or the same arguments with different men or different women. You keep inviting the same person in your life. They're just wrapped up in a different bow, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trauma, that's a bad dude. He 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 everywhere. He, trauma is infused, it's woven in the fabric of our beings. And that's because our community, yes, historically has been held back so much. There is no other community. Black folk have been through more than anyone on this planet ever in the history of life. There is no dispute about that. However, we have to stop looking at the historic trauma and focus on right now. And what are we doing with the historic trauma that is passed on through wounds and sperm through generations, through generations. I'm not saying act like it's not there. I'm saying, what are we going to do about it now? Mm. We're in the trauma unit. We're in the trauma unit. The black community is in the trauma unit. Yep. And we need some triage Yes. called every Grey's Anatomy's nurse you can possibly think of. Okay. <laughs> We need some triage. We do, but that's what this show is about. It's triage for marriages, right, Sean? That's right. Come on, say that. Come on. Oh my God, this has, I don't even know the, the. I don't even have a name or title for this episode. It's so oh, much. Be, oh my God, yeah. yeah. When you're editing and you go back, it'll, it'll come, come to you. you. That's what usually happens. <laughs> Thank you both so much for this phenomenal episode. I want to first of all acknowledge you both for. Uh, the longevity in the marriage, for staying the course, for uh, fighting and not giving up. I want to acknowledge you both for those things <laughs> and want to acknowledge you both as well as being a voice for our community because y'all content is crazy. It's out of here. So y'all continue to do what you're doing. So I want to acknowledge you for those things and just continue to stay encouraged. And I, I just pray that somebody will uh, learn from this because we need this kind of content. Like, yeah. Drama and dysfunction, you know, it runs rampant, but we need stuff like this as well. So I want to acknowledge you both for uh, for having that longevity and doing what you do for our culture. Um, 
Any parting piece of advice before we go? Well, for me, I would say, because you mentioned content. Yes. When you look at the when you're actually looking at these things online, viewing these things, ask yourself this, this is what I do. What's the intent hmm. of this person putting the content out? Hmm. What is the intent of this person putting the content out? So if the intent is just for attention, cloud coins, you name it, chances are you're not going to get anything educational mm-hmm. from it. Mm-hmm. So it's trash. Ma'am. Okay, I love that. Um, I know, right? <laughs> I do, I do. Listen, we're at a time, Sean, that the relationship wars are at an all-time high. Everyone wants to talk about the opposite sex. Everyone is pointing fingers. And I just want people to know, if you come to my spaces, I am not about the relationship wars. I'm about the evolution of the sexes, the evolution of healthy relationships, which will include, again, accountability, calling up, calling out. Um, And I just want us to really take a step back, take a pause, take a breather before we use our thumbs to thug online and spew our trauma, our discomfort, our dislike for the opposite sex. We really can be a mighty force if we work together. It's the time. If we don't work together now, Sean, I don't think we're ever going to. Mm. We have the resources our ancestors did not have. And our generation to me is the best generation because we have one foot out of the digital space and one foot in. Yep. Right. We're the only hybrid generation that remembers what it is to be without social media and this Zoom platform, but also remember when it was in its infancy and just came out. We're like the beta the beta testers here, right? So we understand old school and a little bit of new school. We the cool aunties and uncles at the barbecue. So we have to do better as the uncles and aunties at the barbecue with platforms like this. Men, I want to see platforms where we're not just talking about what women should be doing better and submission with no mission to submit to. Mm -hmm. I want to see platforms where it's like, hey, how does a man stay faithful in the relationship? What happens when you're on that downside where sex is not as frequent as it used to be or good as it used to be? Ladies, I want to see platforms that are not just bashing on men. I want to see platforms that are asking women, how do we change our attitudes and dispositions that we inherited from the women in our lives? Ladies, is it not okay for us to be healthy for our men? Can we change the way we cook? Do we need to use so much salt? Can we keep traditions, but also make them healthy? These are the conversations that I want us to have that are not just submission and what do you bring to the table? Because I don't have time to have conversations about tables. I am a table. I bring the whole table. He bought another one, right? So now we have a big round table. It's not about what I bring. It's about the wholeness that I can aspire to. And while nothing and no one is perfect with God, With respect, boundaries, and communication for yourself and your partner, I really believe, Sean, that we can make it as a culture and a society. RBC, we all we got. (laughs) Come on, nah, that's right. And speaking of the table, make sure that you hire a maid to clean the table after y'all done eating. If you can afford it. And we also need to have conversations (laughs) about fiscal responsibility and budgeting and not spending beyond our means and understanding that, yes, we can take these vacations. I love them. I know we're here for a short time, not a long time and all this other stuff. We need to be able to be owners of our own things, property owners, business owners. And we can't do that when we're trying to keep up with the Joneses. So these are the conversations that I want our community to have that elevate us. And yes, we can have fun and self-help too, right, Sean? Right. Come on now. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Brave Arts community, you heard it here. Make sure you hit the subscribe button if you are watching this via YouTube. Make sure you share this with someone because this marriage work series We're all about promoting healthy marriages. You go through the ebbs and flows. We have ups and downs. It happens to the best of us, right? But we still see great people like Stephanie and Dennis who were able to maneuver through some things and still look good and still be able to speak life to people and continue to do what they do. So make sure you share this with someone. If you are listening via podcast, make sure you leave a rating and review. By doing so, it leaves you in the drawing for a free Amazon gift card. Who doesn't like free stuff, right? So make sure you leave that rating and review. This is Sean. Hey, thanks again for watching another segment of It's Scary to Remarry. I have so much more amazing content and some phenomenal guests as well. People who've been through a divorce, people who remarried, people who desire to marry. So much great content. So make sure 
that you hit one of these videos. It's somewhere around here, but anyway, go watch another video. Thank you.